in prayer. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we want to thank you for gathering us together as this new year starts, as we come together to worship you and to learn more about you and to learn more about your story. Lord, please guide us as we dive into your word. Help us to read, mark, learn, and take it all to heart that we may walk more along your path. All this we pray in your precious and holy name. Amen. Are those people joining? Is that what that is? Or is that messages? That's okay. That's good. <clears throat> all right. So I just wanted to give you all a heads up because I've been working on this. And so I've got about five hours worth of stuff, you know, to fit into about an hour. Uh, the for I, I thought this was going to be like one uh one of the days you choose and make the bible study over but then i heard it was all 12 chapters and i just want you to see what um luther wrote on just the first 12 chapters so we'll see how much of that we get through <laughs> that said let's go ahead and begin i wanted to start off with some of the literary free features of Genesis. You know, this is the book we're diving into. It's where we're starting. It's the beginning of the Bible. And as Pastor Lemke said, it's the beginning for a reason. The very first words, in the beginning, God. All right, that sets the whole stage for what's going to follow. It sets the stage to give you an overview of what we're doing. It sets the stage for the what the book of Genesis, but also the whole Bible is. Our understanding of who God is, as well as our understanding of ourselves. That's theology, the study of God, our understanding of him, and anthropology, our understanding of ourselves, of humans. So when we're looking at Genesis, we need to understand, first off, written by Moses. So that's the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, the Torah that is written by Moses, uh, all the way as they're after Egypt, written by Moses, but inspired by God. Uh, and what do I mean by that? Well, we know what the we talk about the inspiration of the Bible that all Scripture is God breathed uh, and is useful for teaching, rebuking, building up, and the other fourth one I don't remember off the top of my head um, from Second Timothy. There we go, training in righteousness. This is why we have a pastor. <laughs> I'm just a vicar. I can still use that excuse. Uh, but also to point out that Moses is a God is inspiring this, but Moses is a man who is writing it. And so we want to understand it from the aspect of there is a person writing this for other people to read. Moses isn't writing in a mystical or unknowable way. This isn't meant to confuse us. And yet this is the beginning of Genesis is often debated. But Moses is using terms and knowledge that are based in reality. So if you ever hear the arguments about the beginning of Genesis, for instance, um you talk about uh they talk about the word yom it's day they argue about what yom could be what could day be when we're talking about the first second third all the way through the seventh day of creation and 99 percent of the time yom means day the evening to morning right uh the new day starts when the sun sets and ends when the sun sets so that's how the jewish thought was moses is a Jew of the time. He is going to use the words and he's going to write so that other Jews understand. So for this instance, we're not going to look at Yom as if it is some period of undefined time. Like when we say in that day, and it's just this long, far off thing. That's not how Moses was writing. That's not how the Hebrews wrote. When they wrote Yom, they meant a day. And so that's why uh, we look at the six days of creation, and when it says on the first day, we think that is the 24-hour period. Uh, what all this goes to say is uh, not so much, I'm not going to make the argument for creation. We had the um, dinosaur, I'm, <laughs> what's the, what, the big old dinosaur truck came in. The semisaurus, that's it. The dinosaurs, yeah, the semisaurus came in, uh, did all that. What I'm going to say is that so many of these arguments, what they ignore, and I'll try and scoot back a little bit so those of you over there can see this. Um, it'll come back. There we go. 
what so much of this ignores is that um, this is written by a man who's going to be writing this in a way that was understood by the people reading it. This wasn't some type of hidden knowledge that you have to read between the lines. Moses wrote this for other people to read and understand. Um, is it difficult to understand? Absolutely. But does that mean that there's some form of allegory hiding all of this? No. Uh, and there was a, there's a common theme that apparently the Jews made you wait until you were 30 before you read this part of the Torah, the beginning of Genesis, because they thought that you had to be mature in your um, understanding of the rest of scripture before you could read the beginning and understand it. There's still, you know, people twice that age who don't understand it. So uh, this isn't to give you a exact, this is exactly what it means, but it is to paint the picture that we should read this in the way that it is written. We shouldn't try to bring in new thoughts or different understandings that are out of the norm for what Moses would have written. So written by Moses, inspired by God. Uh, for those of you with the notes, I left a nice about three inch gap on the side for if you wanted to take your own notes as we follow along. Um, and looking beyond that, I'm going to skip one. Genesis is read and written as historical writing, not parabolic, not mythological, not allegorical. If you read Genesis, and in the Hebrew it supports this, in the English it supports this, it is read, it is written as if it was a historical book. It follows the same line of grammar that you would expect out of Kings and Chronicles that's recording the history. Um, simple as that. And the reason I say this is sometimes uh, out of the good of our heart, Christians make this way too difficult. Um, and in an attempt to harmonize or understand or who knows what, too many doctoral theses personally. There's enough arguments on Genesis to fill three libraries. Um, too many doctoral papers that need to have a new topic that out of the good of their heart, they try to look at it in a new way. And we just need to see this as the fact that Moses wrote it and it's written like a historical document. Um, and so that's how we read Genesis. That's how we take a look at it. Um, there is no reason really to look at it in any different way. Um, hopping back up one, Genesis could be split up into two different ways. So you've got the whole book, but, uh, you know, you usually categorize into different subsections. Uh, and you can look at it in two ways. The first one, which is what we're kind of, which is, uh, uh, the first one is to split it into two sections, chapters 1 through 11, which is the origin of history, and then chapters 12 through 50 as the origin of Israel. You go through Abraham all the way to Joseph in Egypt. And then Exodus picks up with the 400 years later, a new regime is in place and the Israelites are enslaved uh, rather than uh, rejoiced because Joseph has been forgotten and all that he did. So that's the first way. The second way is splitting it up based on who it's talking about. And that's in six ways, main character side, uh, style, uh, Adam, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. And I don't have the chapters for those off the top of my head, but they split it up based on who the main character of the story is at that time. Um, so an ex uh, at any point, if you have questions, feel free to raise your hand. This is just some intro stuff as we dive in. So I'm kind of rushing through it so that we can get to the fun stuff. But if you have questions, feel free to raise your hand and we'll uh, answer them. I know we won't get through all of this anyway, so you might as well enjoy what we do get through. Uh, going to, you know, looking at also how G uh, Genesis is written as history, we need to understand how Hebrews looked, how Jewish people, how Israelites, uh, I want to stick with that term because we're talking about the Old Testament, how the Israelites, how the Hebrew people looked at history. And the question for the Hebrews when they thought about history was often what? What happened? They didn't think so much or care so much about how it happened, which is a big shift when we get to Greek which is really the start of the whole Western society that we have now. It's the foundations there, because um, Greek went into Roman, and Roman is the Western world. That philosophy of trying to understand how is a much newer thing than when Moses wrote this. The Hebrews really just worried about what happened in history. They didn't try 
to explain it. And God didn't feel the need to explain it because, as we'll find out, it hits the points of what he's trying to show us um, with this origin of history. And we also must understand that when we think of history, you know, you think uh, there, there's an issue when it comes to understanding the Bible. And there's always people who try to take out the miracles, who try to take out the resurrection, the walking on water, the feeding of the 5,000, because that can't be historical because we've never seen it happen. Christians need to have a different understanding of how we look at history. And we have to understand that in history, God is acting. So on the seventh day, God rested, but he didn't keep resting. He didn't turn his attention away to another project. He is still intently focused on our world, and God acts throughout history. Uh, we see divine action take place constantly through it. Um, so that kind of uh, hits the gist there. When we think of history, we need to make sure that we're not trying to divorce God from it, that we're trying to keep him out of it and look at it solely from uh, how some people would say the facts, but God working in history is the facts, right? So we can't divorce divine action from our understanding of what's going on. We can't say, well, uh, this can't be history because it would have involved, there's no way that uh, uh, the ark wouldn't have flooded or something along those lines. And we have to understand God actively working in history to make sure his plans come to fruition. His plan, specifically, of a Savior that's promised in Genesis 1, like Pastor Lemke said, with the, uh, uh, the offspring of woman shall crush your head and you shall bruise his heel. That is the beginnings of the gospel of salvation, the beginnings of the messianic promise. Um, with that, uh, debates over Genesis also happen with the accuracy of it. Um, just to give you an idea of where that comes from, they like to say that multiple texts were combined together. Uh, and they say that for uh, most of the Old Testament. They like to say that multiple texts came together and got combined into this. Uh, and they usually say that because we kind of see some back and forth with uh, timelines. But what that really is is a general description of what happens followed by a specific close-up look. So looking at Genesis 2, that is the creation of man, it follows the six days of creation, and then all of a sudden we hop back a bit, it seems, and we have a second account of creation. It's not a second account. It's not from a different source. This is taking the six days as a general overview, and now we're narrowing to focus on specifically the creation of man. And that happens in Genesis uh, in these first chapters, from what I remember, four different times with uh, with the creation of man. At four, it happens with, uh, what's chapter four? Um, we talk about all of Cain's descendants, and then all of a sudden we seem to hopscotch back to Adam and Seth. And that's because it goes off on that tangent to explain something, and then we get back on the main picture of God's people. Uh, chapter seven, with the flood, it goes through, and we see God's description of the flood, and then all of a sudden it seems like it's a different description. We're talking about seven pairs of clean animals now, and it's not that this is a different text being brought in. This is, here God put it in a general way. Now we're going to focus on what's specifically happening in the situation. Um, so what this is to say is that it's not a contradiction, what the, and it's not multiple coming together and meshing and not being put together well. It is taking a broad view and then after we have the broad view of history, we're narrowing down to God's people and God's actions. Uh, so, and then some fun Hebrew facts for you, the names of Genesis, because they're always all kinds of fun and weird. Um, they all come from Hebrew words. They're all based on it. That's why you say, uh, that's why the words, um, Eve named him Cain, for she had gotten a man. That's the phrasing in the verse there in chapter four. And the reason that is, is because the Hebrew word forgotten for take forgetting is Cain. Cain. Um, Cain is the English way we pronounce it, but Cain is to get. And so that's where I have gotten a man, Cain. Uh, we see Adam from the ground, Adama, Eve from the word for life, Hava. Um, Cain's son, Lame so Cain's son, one of the very sinful ones, we get a whole bunch about Lamech, 
uh, his worldly wives, the one, he's the first one to do polygamy um, and has it messed up pretty quick. Um, his worldly wives are the words for the ornamented one, Ada, and the sweet smelling one, Zillah, focused on themselves and uh, you know the boasting of the individual instead of the boasting of God. Um, Noah from Nuak, which is rest, and Lamech, uh, his father Lamech, a different Lamech, says, this one will give us rest. Um, and so we kind of see how Hebrew works through their names. They're, I think they're so much cooler than English names because um, they actually mean something. You know, all of the ones that end in ah, like Elijah and Obadiah, all of that is saying something connected to God. Obadiah is from Obed and Yahweh meaning servant of God. So Obadiah literally means servant of God. Like Hebrew names are just so much better. Um, yeah, I, I won't go off on that rant. Hebrew is just a great language. Uh, Babel is from the word for confusion, Balal. So all of this comes from uh, this reason. Uh, and then Babel just tends to work with English because babbling on and on and on and on and on and on. All that fun stuff. All right, so that's kind of the introduction to Genesis there. Um, and now we're going to look at what Genesis uh, actually is explaining to us. I just realized there's a whole other half of the room that I'm barely looking at as I speak. Uh, sorry, guys. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Luis. <laughs> uh, how does Genesis 1 through 12 affect our understanding of who God is? So God, as we've got, I've got three points here. God is everlasting, God as creator, and God as Elohim. Three aspects of God that we want to understand that we get from what Genesis 1 through 12 is saying. So God is everlasting, existing before time and existing outside of it. In the beginning tells us more than science or the imagination could, right? From before history, from before time, but from before matter, God existed. I forget, I have to stand by the computer. They need to hear me, don't they? Um, now, some beg the question that, look, all of history contains gods. Therefore, they're all made up for a primitive man. Um, if all things were made and all people come from one man and woman, I don't know, I'd say, don't you expect every single culture ever to think of gods as a thing? Where else would we come up with it from the fact that there is a God that over time has been misunderstood and uh, has spread out as the people have spread? Um, I don't know. That's an argument that I hear every now and then. They like to say that religion is for a primitive man. We don't need it anymore. But I think there's a point to the fact that every single culture in existence has had gods and I think it all points back to the fact that we came from a group of people who knew that there was one God, and then it just evolved over time as people worshipped idols. As we worship, and this moves into the next part, God as creator, where we worship the creation instead of the creator itself. Um, I like how Pastor Lemke talked about the days of creation with the light, followed by the sun, moon, and stars afterwards. Other people have talked about the fact that with creation, you have three acts. God made everything. God accentuated everything, which is essentially put it into its place. So light, um, sea, land, and then God, uh, what is it, ordered it, right? And so that's where you get sun, moon, and stars. That's where you get fish and birds. That's where you get animals, plants, and humans. And I've also heard it where it's like God made the light. And then the sun, moon, and stars three days later to make sure that you are not worshiping the sun, moon, and stars. The light was there before them. They are not. But and yet, in these uh, mythological religions, so often it's the sun that gets worshipped. It's rain that gets worshipped. It's the ground and trees and nature and creation that tends to get worshipped. That's the issue that comes about uh, with this uh, idolatry is that the creation begins to get the worship that only belongs to God as creator, right? Um, that was really the problem when it came to uh, Aaron and the golden calf and Israel. It wasn't that they were worshiping a different God. They made the calf and they made one calf to try and symbolize God, Yahweh himself, but they're making something themselves. They're looking at creation and that creation is becoming the thing they're praising instead of God. And so they're I, their focus went from God 
solely to this metal calf that they made. And that's where the idolatry comes in, is this, this worshiping, this holding up of creation instead of the creator. So God as creator, the act of creation distinguishes God, the God of the Bible. It distinguishes him from all competitors where he is outside of creation. He is not part of creation. He's not, and he makes himself within it. He puts himself into history and in flesh and in the incarnation in Jesus, he makes himself a part of creation, but he is from outside creation. Kevin is here. He's going to try and trip me up with something. God being all-knowing and all-powerful knew that man was going to sin. And a lot of, I, I've read a lot that said that sin is related to free will. And why did God imbue man with free will? I think I told, he, so he's asking, why did God imbue man with free will? And he talked to me about this earlier, and I thought I told him to wait until I was talking about the image of God in man. Um, but that's, a, okay, he's got to leave, so that's why. We'll hop ahead just so you can see that, and I answer this. Man as created in God's image. Let us make. Um, and there's some different thoughts about what God's image is. And a lot of people like to look at it as the rational soul. Let me find my notes so I'm saying the three things right. Um, what you guys have, I have about double here. So I wanted to make sure I don't uh, start rambling too long. Uh, a rational soul, discussed often as like memory, intellect, and will. This is a very philosophical way of looking at the image of God. Came about in the Middle Ages. And this, uh, or even before that, with like St. Augustine um, did a similar thing where he talked about memory, intellect, and will, the mental faculties as the image of God. Um, and that's not a bad way to look at it, but we can take it way too far to the point that it's not helpful. Because um, we're created for more than just eating and drinking. Otherwise, we would be the same as the animal. So there has to be something more than just the mental faculties, right? And so Luther posited this, uh, and I would agree with it, is another aspect of it is the utter trust and, how do I write that? Utter trust and belief that God was good. Knowing God and fully believing that he is good, but also living a life that was wholly godly without fear of death or any danger, content with God's favor. Um, before the fall, before the devil came and tempted Adam and Eve, there was no need for fear of a free will because we were made in God's image, living fully a godly life. The issue isn't how God created us. Um, he created us perfect in the image of God, with the ability to live godly lives, pleasing him, to know him, to trust him, to not fear these dangers. And when the devil tempts us, that is where this free will was twisted. This is also hops ahead a little bit when we talk about Satan's tools. But one of the things that he does so often is twist God's will for good into something evil. Uh, that's one of the tools that I don't have in my notes, so I'll mention it now. Uh, the thing that Satan does so often in his temptations is to twist God's will into something bad, or to make us think that it's not good, or to make us question it. Um, doubts and lies, those are his two big things, and it's always to twist God's will. His biggest trick for us, I teach the seventh graders this in confirmation when we're talking about the commandments, is to make us think that the commandments aren't, um, aren't good for us, that they don't lead to a good life, that they aren't fun to keep. His biggest thing to do is to twist us into making them look like work that we don't want to do. And I would say that it's a very similar thing with free will. We think about it now. We think about the fact that, oh, if God hadn't done this, then we wouldn't have sinned in all this. But God made us perfect in the first place. It's Satan's temptations. Um towards us that drew us away from that image of God, that corrupted it, obscured it, whatever language you want to use. I wouldn't say that it's gone because we are made new through Christ, but it is obscured, it's covered up, it's corrupted until that last day when Jesus comes and we're raised again and the sinful flesh is cast off and we're made new, body and soul, once more. Um, does that answer your question, Kevin? 
Okay. Well, I would argue maybe I shouldn't have said made perfect. We were made very good. God made us as he wanted to make us. Um, and then we can, you know, I don't want to get into it, but there's an argument of what it means to be made perfect. Um, and is God the only thing that can be perfect? Can we be made how he wants us and that be perfect? Or does perfect have one definition? And I don't have, uh, I don't want to take three hours to argue that. So um, God made us in the image of God that gave us free will. He said all things were very good. He made us how he wanted to make us. It was Satan who came in and twisted it. And the bigger issue is when we have these conversations and we somehow, and Satan gets exactly what he wants, when we somehow paint God as the bad guy for giving us free will in the first place. Um, it's exactly, that's the exactly the line of thought that uh, Satan wants us to follow, is to paint God in that way. Carol? The way I think about it is God didn't want robots. No, he, he didn't want... I mean, obviously, God can do whatever he wants, but he didn't want to create people to just not have any choice and, and be a robot. And, yeah. you know, so, he, so he wanted us, he wants us to choose to follow him. He doesn't want to create us so that we have no choice and we have to follow him. Mm -hmm. He wants us to do it willing. To do that, he gives us free choice. So that is uh, that what Carol just said for those of you on Zoom so you can hear is that God didn't make us to be a robot, um, that he wanted us to have the, the free choice to be able to love him. Um, I've heard that before. I do agree with it. Um, I don't think that's wrong by any means. I just I'm looking more at the source of free will being from God because we're made in his image. Um, and I think if you want to go into the whys or the hows, that's as good of a reason uh, as any I could ever think of. I think that God uh, made us in this way so that we would be his loving children, not just mindless animals running based on instinct and how God has set up the world and not based on um, servants who uh, do the whim with no creativity, no mind, no imagination, no will for themselves. Um, God made us how he intended for a purpose, uh, and that was to be his loving children, to be in the image of him, to rule over creation. Um, and all of this gets twisted with sin. Uh, yeah, and Kevin's gone now. So you can hop back up for just a second. So God as creator, just to uh, clarify that part, um, the act of creation distinguishes God, right? Uh <clears throat> Yeah, creation is the act only attributed to God. And this is an important part for our understanding of when we uh, debate with others and why we, know, why we claim and why we know that Jesus claims to be God, is that he claims to be part of creation, right? And John says the same thing. But in Jewish thought, in Israelite thought, the only thing that can do creation is God. So if Jesus takes part in creation, that means that Jesus is God. Um, there is no, he's not an intermediary in the sense that he's, you know, like he's kind of God. God made him to be like, kind of like us. Uh, that's all um, nonsense that doesn't make sense in any kind of Jewish Israelite thought. And it doesn't make sense in Christian thought either. If you have to do with, if you do creation, you are God. And so when we hear that Jesus was the word, um, and when we hear the different parts where he is part of creation and doing the act of it, we know that he is God. Um, so these arguments for understanding who God is affect us. Why we read Genesis, why we read the Old Testament is because all of this points to Christ, right? The Old Testament points to Christ. The New Testament points back to Christ. And it all centers, just like our last hymn, um, he entered our human story, uh, God in him is centered, or whatever the line was. I think that's about right. Um, exactly what that is. It centered on him is God's story of everything. And that's why we read the Old Testament, because our understanding of who God is, is tied to how we know that Jesus claims to be God. Um, and then God as Elohim. 
Uh, that's one of the names for God, one of the names used often. Uh, his act, the name that he gives us is Yahweh, coming from the word I am, I am who I am, um, coming from Hava to be. So Yahweh, I am. Um, I will be, I always was, always am. Um, so that's his name. The Jews didn't say that. They thought uh, to keep the second commandment, um, they didn't want to profane God's name. So they figured we'll never use God's name. That way we can't break the commandment. No, I'm I'm not sure if any of them thought that through or if they were just looking for loopholes. Um, but you can profane God without using his name. <laughs> uh, but Yahweh is one of them. Elohim is another common one. Adonai, meaning my Lord, uh, is another common one. The vowels for Adonai with the let with the consonants from Yahweh make Jehovah. That's where that comes from, if you're curious. It's not a name in the Bible. Um, people have taken Yahweh, and Hebrew doesn't have vowels originally, and they've taken the vowels for Adonai, and they've combined them so that you have Yehovah, Jehovah. Um, not a name in the Bible for God, but when you say it, people tend to know what you mean, and so that you know that's where it comes from. Uh, but God as Elohim, God, uh, what is Elohim? That im ending means it's plural, uh, and we often call this the plural of majesty, right? And that means two different kinds of things. One is just for powerful people, it's like God of very God, Lord, oh Lord, right? Like it's uh, eg like exacerbating, uh, emphasizing, that's the E word I want to use, emphasizing the power of the one that you're speaking of. That is the plural of majesty, um, used for strength and power, but it is also still plural. And we see words like with creator, let us make, right? Um, and the conversations that God has with what it seems to be is God. Uh, and so we also see that plural of majesty in action as an actual plural, as we understand it today, when we talk about the Trinity in creation. And this is another one where Pastor Lemke's sermon, for those who heard it, for those who will, um, did a great job of covering uh, how we see the Trinity in creation. Um, God the Father created the universe through God the Son. That is the word of God. That is Jesus. And God the Spirit presides, hovers, broods, whatever word we're translating it as, over all of it. So we see in those very first chapters, all of how we think of God, who God is, the Trinity we see in creation, God the Father creating through God the Son, the Word of God, and the Spirit hovers over all of it. Um, I can read that real quick for you, just so that you see exactly how it is spoken. Um, don't worry, Zoom, I'm just pulling it up. On, I'm just pulling up the words to read. You don't need to see it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The, the earth was without form and void. Darkness was over the face of the deep. And the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So God created. Often we think of that as God the Father created. The spirit of God was hovering and God spoke. There is the word. And Jesus is the word made flesh. Pastor Lemke? We do what we, the word, you know, people will tell you the word Trinity isn't in the Bible, and you're correct. But the doctrine that we use the word to describe is God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are seen throughout Scripture. Um, how does Genesis 1 through 12 affect our understanding of who we are as humans, our anthropology? These are kind of the two big points I wanted to get through, and I'd love to get through a lot more, but we'll at least get through these. Uh, we talked a bit about man as created in God's image, um, and I don't think we need to rehash that because we 
went through it with Kevin, but being rational souls, utter trust and belief that God was good. Um, and I would say that, uh, you know, if you want to think of um, what it is to be made in the image of God, to be made very good, to be made as he plans, I think a perfect rational soul without our memory, intellect, or reason corrupted by sin um, and our utter trust in God, I think those two things together make a pretty good image that we still can't imagine. Um, and, uh, you know, the rational soul, meaning the uncorrupted soul, right? Our reason, our intellect uh, is not what it was. Um, there's a reason we can't imagine it. Uh, no, that uh, that aspect of our abilities has been corrupted by sin. Um, but then we also see man as born in the image of Adam. We see those words specifically when Seth is given birth to, right? Adam says, uh, or it says that Adam gave birth, or not Adam didn't give birth, but uh, Adam fathered Seth uh, in his own image. So man is no longer in the, it no longer is the complete image of God. Um, we're now made in the image of man. Um, and that image, so the image of God is corrupted in us. All men are now inherently sinful. Uh, this is the aspect. When we talk about original sin, about what is wrong with us, about why we are constantly dragged towards sin, it's because now we are made and born in the image of man no longer in the image of God, which has been obscured, covered up, corrupted within us. Um, but it says right there at the beginning that Adam passed on this fallen nature, his now, and now his image, to all of his offspring. And that continued on to us still today. That is where we need that forgiveness of original sin. Yeah, Lynn? It's sort of like a photocopy. You have your original print document, and instead of scanning it, you photocopy it, it's faded. Mm -hmm. And if you photocopy that photocopy, and eventually you'll end up with something you can barely read because you're copying a copy and it's disappearing. Yeah. So we're, uh, for those on the Zoom, we're all just a bunch of photocopies of uh, God created and printed out Adam. And then Adam just started photocopying instead of scanning and reprinting. So uh, now we're all pretty faded. I find, you know, I, I think it's funny you say that. I did a little bit, uh, my major was chemistry, but also I did some biology beforehand. And it's funny because as we go, you know, we've got long telomeres on our DNA, which is long strands of DNA that doesn't really do anything. But it's there because slowly uh, with each new generation, a little bit more of it gets cut off in replication. Um, and so the telomeres are getting shorter and shorter. Each photocopy is getting worse and worse. Um, fun science fact for you. I'm sure doctors here are uh, cringing at how oversimplified I've just made that. <laughs> um, and man has fallen and corrupted by sin, right? Here's the trifecta. The attitude of the sinner is to deny responsibility. That's what Cain did. That's what Adam and Eve did when they tried to pass it on to someone else back to the serpent. That's what Cain did when he tried to say, am I my brother's keeper? Why do I need to do this? That is what every sinner has done. And then once we deny that responsibility, we then resent God for him saying that, no, the responsibility is on us. That is the attitude of the sinner, denying responsibility and then resentment of God for calling us um, to accept it. So God, and then a few other notes here, God recognizes our sin from youth. That's, a, uh, that's when he's talking about, um, this is after the flood, right? Uh, and Noah comes off the ark and God's making the new covenant with him. And like, he says, I'll never destroy the earth again for sin because man is corrupted from youth. Uh, another understanding of how we are fallen from the very beginning. Um, at some point, because uh, I don't want, uh, I'm going to go until somebody tells me to stop talking, and I'm going to just stop looking at the clock, and you guys can tell me when I need to stop. Uh, another point, Genesis 10, this was an interesting one from our Bibles that I wanted to point out. Uh, the little devotions that come along, they made a really interesting point when it came to looking at the Tower of Babel and looking at all the sins that have happened up to this point. 
um, guilt-driven motivation isn't going to work on a sinful people. Guilt-driven motivation is what takes place from that denying responsibility and moving us into resentment. Uh, something that every sinner that we see in these first 12 chapters does is deny that it's their fault. Then God says, no, it is. And then rather than repent, they start to complain that the punishment is too much, right? That's what happens with Cain. He says he doesn't repent. But when God says, cursed are you from the ground and you'll be a fugitive and wanderer for your life, uh, he doesn't repent and realize that what he did was wrong. He just complains that the punishment is too much and he won't be able to handle it. Uh, you know, that's not repentance in Cain's voice afterwards. The The mark that God puts on him isn't because of repentance. But as we see uh, in the uh, next section, um, it's the act of God's grace where in one hand is judgment and in the other is grace. Um, and so the act, our attitude is constantly denying responsibility, resenting God, and our actions are constantly going against God's plan. Um, we see that with Cain's descendants. Uh, they talk about the fact that they made the artists, they made the musicians, they made the poetry, they made the machine, the the tools to cut metal and different things, right? These guys, the inventors of those things uh, for their groups of people and Lamech marrying two wives and all this other stuff is so that they're focused inward on themselves and on the earthly life that they're living, um, trying to fill the gap that comes from our fallen nature with the fallen world around us. The same thing that we see today where people try to fill up their lives with um, sex, drugs, and rock and roll and try to combine it all to fill some kind of gap they have that's really missing because we are fallen creatures and what they're lacking is an understanding of the love of God for them. Um, and so we see them continually striving against God's plan. Uh, we'll do Adam and Eve, four stories of sin, punishment, and grace, and then we'll keep moving because there's some fun notes at the end. Uh, Adam and Eve, what was the sin? It was, um, and when we're thinking about what the actual sin that Adam and Eve committed, we usually say the apple. I'm going to say no. Um, just a quick answer, but... Uh, it is the doubting is the first part. Um, the devil asked, did God really say? And Adam and Eve said, and Eve was like, well, maybe he didn't. So there's the doubt. And then comes the, the disobeying God's command. Uh, and that's the, that's the tactic, right? Lies and deception, um, questions and lies from the devil to make us doubt and then to make us disobey. So that was the sin. The punishment we get from Eve, childbirth, we get disorder in the house. So you think about this, and everybody always cringes at the idea of who's over who and all these different things and dominion and submission and all those words that come with a lot of uh, baggage in the English language. Um, and I think we want to understand it, and I'll take it out of the marriage, and I'll put it into how we understand us ruling over the world, because it's similar words, dominion over creation, right? We were supposed to rule over creation in a way that was beneficial to creation. What's happened after sin is that we now rule over them with a, with a closed fist, right? And we beat creation into submission. The dominion that God planned for us has been twisted and corrupted. So the relationship that God planned for man and wife has been twisted and corrupted. And that word that he uses with the punishment of Eve, that your, um, that your will will be contrary, that you will be contrary to your husband, that you will be towards your husband, right? Your desire will be towards your husband. It's the same words that are used when he's talking to Cain and he says, sin, sin's desire will be contrary to you. Sin will be contrary, will be uh, towards you. And what that is, is against you. Um, and we get that same image of God's initial plan twisted. Uh, and so I know this, the words submission, the words rule over, the words head of the house uh, all carry baggage. And what it is, is that there was this picture of how a marriage was supposed to be. And with sin, God's will is twisted and corrupted into something different. And that's where we get, um, that's where we get abusive husbands. That's where we get 
uh, the issues were, um, you know, that we have where we don't like the word submission and we only see the word submission in a bad way, right? All of this comes from the baggage that comes with it and comes from a twisted understanding of what God's will was for us. It wasn't um, a man with a rod beating his wife into submission. It was a loving relationship where there was one and the other and they were one body. Two came together to make one flesh and that has been corrupted through sin. Um, so when we talk about disorder in the house, the her desire will be towards her husband. Uh, desire towards her husband is not a good phrase. English might not paint that in the best picture, but it's the same words used with sin towards Cain, a twisting of God's will. Um, but then where is the grace? It's the first promise of the gospel. That's where he promises that your offspring will crush the serpent's head and the serpent will bite his heel. Um, but that is the, the euangelion, the proto-euangelion, the first gospel. Um, before the actual promise of the Messiah, we have this promise that your offspring will pay for this sin. Um, that is the first promise of a savior. Uh, and so in one hand, God judges and you get your punishment. But in the other, God has grace um, for his children. Um, we'll hop down a bit. The rest of those are very similar. It's the same questions over and over. We've talked about um, or how what's the pattern and principle. It's judgment, but also redemption um, kind of going along there. We've talked about some of the other sins that appear in Genesis. Lamech has a lot of them, more murder, more polygamy, more focusing on the world and turning away from God. Um, we've talked about the temptations of Satan being uh, doubts and lies, right? Um, working to make you doubt God, working to deceive you. Uh, those are his two main tricks that he still uses today. Doubts and lies, deception and lies, questions. And what's our primary weapons against his attack? This was in my sermon last week, but it's prayer. That's what Jesus talks about in Matthew 4, 4, prayer against the devil. And also um, submitting yourselves to God, resisting the devil, drawing near to him, cleanse your hands, purify your hearts. This is what James is talking about, repenting, recognizing, you know, recognizing the responsibility we do have in not resenting God for it but recognizing where we failed and repenting and asking God for forgiveness instead. Um, points of interest. I would love to be able to go through more of these, uh, but how? when do we actually have to be done? Probably soon. Five minutes ago, so I should have been done. Okay. Um, there's a lot of interesting points there. Uh, Cain's offering being rejected. There's different ways of looking at it. Um, but it really comes down to a problem with the Jews had and the problem we still have today where we look at God's command simply as a legal set of check marks. And so his heart wasn't in it. His heart wasn't towards God. But Abel came and gave the first fruits of his sheep, the first fruits of fat, right? Um, I want to bring up this one because Kevin made a comment of it, and then we're going to end. Uh, Nephilim and the mighty men of renown. Nephilim, there's a lot of, I call it Bible fan fiction. Um, it's a lot of stuff. People have Bible hot takes on what these things mean. The Nephilim are not half angel, half humans. Um, sons of God are the righteous from the line of Seth. J Israelites and Jews, it's very common to call yourself a son of God. Um, so the sons of God were just those who worshiped God. The daughters of man are from the unrighteous line of Cain. They're the ones who did not worship God. The, the sons of God falling for the daughters of man or the sons of God falling for worldly people um, and leaving the worship of God. Mighty men is just the word for warriors, for strength, for strong people. Men of renown means they were known. I mean, these people were tyrants. They were bullies. They were outlaws of the Wild West. If that's how you want to think about them, we hear the word mighty men of renown and we think great things. Don't. They were like Jesse James. They were like the, the Wild West outlaws. They were like the gangsters of Al Capone. They were there causing trouble, and people were afraid of them. Uh, Nephilim weren't half angels. Angels, Jesus says that angels aren't given in marriage. He describes how angels act. Angels don't reproduce. The sons of God 
are from the are the righteous believers. The daughters of man are the unrighteous unbelievers. Um, and it's really funny. And I'll end with this: the Son of God, uh, we say to Jesus, paints him as divine, but really calling him a Son of God paints him as more of an Israelite and a human. And calling him Son of Man is what paints him as divine, because where Son of Man is where the promises of the messianic promise tends to be held. So it's just a real, you know, how we think about that. But we should, you know, don't read sons of God as if it's angels here. Um, Adam was called a son of God. The, those who believe in him are called sons of God. Um, there's plenty of more information in there. Feel free to look over it. If you have questions, feel free to ask. But uh, boldly and confidently we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you all. Like I said, there was way too much to cover in this 12 chapters. I could have written I could have written the whole doctoral thesis on it for this one. Um, see some of you up in church and see some of you next week. <laughs> Keep on reading.